That idea of the Holy Spirit, welcoming the Holy Spirit to <coughs> overwhelm us, to overcome us, is a huge thing. And religiously, we could say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place, fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. And we could say that religiously. Imagine if that actually happened. Are you really ready for that? Are you really in a place in your life where you're like, God, bring it. Whatever you want. You want me to go to my school and start telling my friends about the importance of a relationship with Jesus? He tells you to do that anyway. But are you ready for that kind, for God to stir that kind of stuff in your heart? Are you ready to be in a place where you go, Holy Spirit, show me what you want. I want you to go to a different country. Holy Spirit, tell me what you want in Upland. <laughs> right? And we start to put conditions on it. We start to go, as long as, as long as I don't have to feel uncomfortable, as long as I don't have to do anything that people are going to think is weird, as long as I don't have to do anything I don't want to do, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Jonah was in that place. Jonah was a prophet of God. Jonah was someone who heard the voice of God and had been obedient and gone and been prophetic, speaking the words of God into people's lives. And then the word came from God to Jonah. Hey, Jonah, this isn't just going to be about something somebody else needs to do. This is going to be about you. You go to Nineveh and you tell them, that the way they're living is going to destroy them. And that if they don't turn, if they don't change and repent, they're going to be wiped out. Jonah lost his spiritual mind. He went, whoa, 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 n n n n not Nineveh. Nineveh? Nineveh? The enemy of your people? That, that city, it is so, it is gross it is ungodly. I mean, it's demonic. It's a, it's a satanic place. And you want me to go there so that they will hear the truth of who you are, say they're sorry, and be forgiven. And then they're going to get to have a relationship with you like I have. They're going to get to spend eternity with you in the presence of me? And Jonah loses his mind. And he, in the face of God, says, I'm not doing it. And he takes off and he heads for the coast. He figures as long as he can get as far away from, from Nineveh as he can, huh, what's God gonna do, force him? So he tries to, to position himself as far away from God as he could. You ever try that in your life? You kind of know, you get, you get the sense of, of what is right or what, what God is leading you to. Somebody that God's calling you to talk to or, or someplace God's calling you to go. And you're like, yeah, yeah. And we try and distance ourselves. Yeah, we're, I know we're going to be talking about this at youth group and it's probably pretty relevant to my life and something I should probably hear. But you know what? I have too much homework. You know what? I, I know that I should probably, there's, there's this guy at my school and he's always alone at lunch. And I see him, I notice him every day and I ignore him every day and I'm really feeling like I should go and I, I feel like I'm supposed to go and invite him to, to eat with my group of friends. <laughs> nah, that's okay. My friends will think that's weird. And, and you know, I, I have my, my tight little group. We don't need anybody new. We know what God's calling us to. God's stirring something up in us. And we try and distance ourselves as far from that thing as possible. If you have any desire for God in your life, if you have ever prayed and said, God, I want to see you move. God, I want to feel you. God, I want to know you. I guarantee anybody who has ever prayed that has done this. Has done the Jonah thing where it's like, I didn't mean that. 
and we distance ourselves and we go, well, if I can get as far away from that as possible, well, then I don't have to feel guilty anymore. I don't have to feel conviction. I don't have to be put into an awkward situation. And this is exactly what Jonah did. I'm not going to Nineveh. That's crazy. I hate that place. I hate those people. I do not want anything good for them. I don't want God to show them mercy. I'm gone. And he heads for the coast and he gets on a boat. He buys his ticket. And I don't know what he said. I don't know if there was one boat headed out of the harbor that day or he went up and went, what's the farthest you go? Tarshish. One ticket to Tarshish, please. And he gets on this boat and heads out to sea. Somewhere out there, a storm kicks up. Things are getting bad. The crew is freaking out. Water is coming up over the sides of the boat and everybody's losing their mind and they start pulling out all their, their beads and all their, their medallions of whatever God they worshiped and they start praying and they start tr- crying out to their gods that, that he'd saved them. And they notice that Jonah is asleep in the boat. I can't sleep on a boat in a storm. It's like, Jonah didn't have this issue. And they wake him up. I imagine that in the chaos of thinking your boat is going to sink, that it was not like, Jonah, hey. Come on, big guy. Wake up. Oh, sleepyhead. I imagine it was the captain or one of the crew, a foot right to the ribs. Dude, get up. What? What are you doing? Pray to your God that we'd be saved. These guys were trying everything. Jonah wakes up and the second he wakes up, guess who's still there? God. Jonah knows he can't escape God. His theology is correct in that you can't outrun God. You can't can't get away from God. What Jonah was trying to do was get away from the situation. Jonah wasn't thinking he could hide from God. He was hiding from where God was calling him to be. And he figured on a boat, what's God going to do? Force me? And when he wakes up, God is still there. And God is speaking to Jonah. God and Jonah, they have a talking relationship. And God goes, you know what I called you to. You know what I told you to do. And Jonah comes to the realization that God's will is going to be done. One way or the other, God was going to have his way. And so somewhere in his heart, in this, I don't know, a flash of brilliance or obedience or whatever it was, he goes, you know what? Either one of two things is going to happen. One, God is going to destroy me. Or two, he's going to do something supernatural. So he goes to the captain of the boat and he says, it's me. I am the reason for this storm. I am the cause of this because I have been running from what God has called me to do. (laughs) The captain of the boat goes, okay, good to know. What do we do? And again, Jonah knew either God was going to destroy him or God was going to do something supernatural. And so Jonah goes, well, when there's something that's a problem, you get rid of the problem. I'm the problem. Throw me in the water. (laughs) The captain's not a murderer. So he's like, not throwing you in the water, you lunatic. Start grabbing stuff and throwing it overboard. And they start throwing everything off the boat. Just unloading everything. Food, food clothes, every, it's, it's, I mean, it's a yard sale out there on the sea. Just woo, just, everything's gone and they are still sinking. The waves are getting bigger. The wind is getting stronger. It's tearing the boat apart. Jonah's standing there going, it's me, it's me. Hello, it's me. Throw me over the side. Everybody's like, no, <laughs> it's me. Hey guys, God told me it's me. Finally, everybody stops, looks at Jonah and goes, dude, maybe it's him. (laughs) They grab Jonah 
and they're like, ah, God, I don't know how you do this. I, I, don't, I don't know what the pro- procedure is. You know, it's like, um, do we go on three? <laughs> it's like, okay, you grab his arms, grab his legs. You know, you ever do this into the pool? <laughs> Accidentally throw them all the way across the pool and they land on the deck on the other side. That doesn't score a lot of points with parents. Anyway, that's the story for a different time. So they swing him. One, two, three, and they just let him go. And they're like, ah! Oh! And the waves stop. Jonah hits that water. It's colder than he thought it was going to be. And it sort of takes his breath away. In the waves, in the, just the current of the sea, there's no way you can swim for very long. And before long, he begins to sink under the waves. God's either going to destroy him or God's going to do something supernatural. And in verse 17, it says that God provided a large fish. Okay, is this destroying or something supernatural? Supernatural. It might be both. (laughs) He gets eaten, the end, right? God provides a large fish and swallows Jonah. Now, I talked about this the first week we launched into this, this book, that some people use this story as a reason to go, the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales. The Bible, this couldn't have really happened. This, this isn't real. And here are the reasons why I believe that this is true. Why I believe that this story is literal. Why I believe that it is in the Bible for a reason. First of all, this story isn't about a guy getting swallowed by a fish, okay? If, if that's all we get out of the story of Jonah, we've missed it. And that's what we've been going through the last couple of weeks. I believe this is actually absolutely true because I believe that for the God who created the heavens and the earth, who created light and darkness, who created you and me, for that God, it's no big deal to get a whale to swallow a guy. For the guy to survive and for him to end up going where he needed to go. That's not not a big deal. Second reason I believe this is true, Jesus believed it was true. Jesus taught from the Old Testament. He, He taught the scriptures. And so Jesus believed this. If Jesus believed it, good enough for me. So in this place, Jonah is thrown into the water and God sends a giant fish to eat him, swallowed him whole. It's like reverse sushi. (laughs) Manshi. Which I don't know if that works or not. And it says he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, something interesting that I, and I didn't know this, But for the literary time period, something that was written three days and three nights meant was used to mean long enough to be dead. And and we don't need to get caught up with like, was it literally three days and three nights? Was it 72 hours or, or what? It was long enough to be dead, like definitely dead. I imagine that that ship that threw him overboard because they were not murderers, because that was probably the craziest thing they've ever done, I'd imagine they circled the area a bit. They waited to see what would happen. They waited to see if he would resurface once the storm calmed down. Okay, maybe he's going to miraculously come back or, or whatever. And he didn't. He was in the fish long enough to be dead. Everybody was sure. There was no search party. They weren't trying to recover the body. They didn't send the Coast Guard. It was, he, he was, he gone, right? <laughs> That was all there was to Jonah. So he's in the fish for, for three days and three nights. And it's inside the fish that God does something miraculous. See, we want to, again, focus on this guy gets swallowed by a fish. Let's make the story about that. Let's make the story about a guy who survived being swallowed by a fish. Let's make the story about that and let's all go, ooh, ah, isn't that incredible? I don't believe it and move on. But it's in the fish 
that the real miracle happens. And it says this, chapter two, uh, verse one, starting in verse one, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. <laughs> Where is he? He's in a fish. Okay. And he's saying, you helped me. You heard my cry. Okay. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me, and all the waves and the breakers swept over me. And I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I'll look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me and deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Now we pay a bunch of money to have seaweed wrapped around our head. Anyway. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. This is an interesting prayer. This is an interesting cry out to God. But what this says to us is that this is the process that Jonah went through in his situation. Getting thrown into the sea, getting swallowed by a fish. And apparently it wasn't like, Oh my Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There was a process in the fish other than digestion that Jonah went through where he was like, I, I was hurled into the depths. Everything just crashed around me. Every, it was over, I was done. Let me ask you this. In your life, have you ever been really honest with God. Have you ever been really honest about how, what you're experiencing and how you're feeling in your relationship with God? Anybody here ever yelled at God? Anybody here ever just been like, you're out of your mind, all powerful God. You don't know what you're doing. How could you let me? How could you let this happen? How could you be okay with this? Have you ever come, come to a place in your life where you're like, I'm done with the, Lord, thank you for helping me. Have a good day. Pray that you'd bless this food to my body. Help me to have a good night's sleep. Put your angels around me and protect me. Amen. I'm done with that. God, I am not okay with where I'm at right now. I am not okay with what you're allowing to happen. I'm not okay with how I'm feeling. I'm not okay with, this, this whole thing is messed up. Have you ever come to a place where you're willing to be really honest with God? If not, why? Religious thing? Think, well, I'm not allowed to be angry at God. I'm not allowed to yell at God. Everything has to be nod your head and, oh, everything's okay. And that's not what I'm reading here. That's not what I'm seeing Jonah do. He's going, you threw me in the depths. You, okay, I may have not done what you wanted me to do, but come on, God. Really, was this necessary? Swallowed by a fish, Ugh. Really? Have you ever been there with God? Have you ever been willing to honestly acknowledge how you're feeling in your relationship with God or in your pursuit of God? Here's why I wanna encourage you to be honest. One, you're not going to hurt God's feelings. God does not want a bunch of head nodders. He doesn't want a bunch of people who just smile and ignore reality, ignore the circumstances of their life and just sort of nod, yeah, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> but if we aren't actually pursuing a relationship with God, If we are unwilling to be honest, if we're unwilling to be real and express our heart to God, then all you're pursuing, you're not pursuing a relationship with God, you're pursuing looking like you're pursuing a relationship with God. And there is a huge difference. You can come here on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights and you can look like you're pursuing God. Congratulations, you fooled us all. You can fool me. I'm not doing background checks. I'm not like following you around and watching every move you make every day. I, congratulations, you can fool me. You can fool us. 
But if you're not, act, if you're not being honest with God, if you're not willing to go to God and be like, I am, I am alarmed. <laughs> I am distressed. I am hurting, I am angry, I'm offended. If we're not willing to go to God with that, then all we're really pursuing is looking like we're pursuing a relationship with God. Some of you are doing that. I have done that. I look great. I look pastoral. I look like a guy who has been raised in a Christian home and I know all the right moves and I know all the right words and prayers and and I end up looking like I'm pursuing God. Jonah was in a place where he's like, you threw me in the depths. Not cool. The earth just, I mean, the, the earth and the waves just arr, swallowed me up. But God begins to transform his heart in the belly of that fish. God reminds Jonah, as he had, I'm sure, a hundred times, I'm with you. I love you. I have a purpose for your life. You're not going to be destroyed. Will you trust me? And will you do my will? Will you allow me to lead your life? And this is where we see a difference in what's going on in Jonah's heart. In verse six, but you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. When he was in that place, he remembered the God he knew. He remembered the promises of God. He remembered how God promised to be with him who God was, and he decided to allow that God to demonstrate his faithfulness, to walk him through this ugly situation that didn't, that he just, ah, I mean, there had to have been a point where Jonah was like, I'm getting what I deserved. But there's still that desire, self-preservation. And he goes, but God, you brought me life. Realize He's still sitting in a fish saying, you brought me up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you. And then Jonah speaks out one of the lessons. And one of the things, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. If you want a verse to memorize, if you want something that you need to remember consistently, this is it. Whether you have grown up in church, you call yourself a Christian, whether you're here today and you're like, ah, oh, this whole church thing, I'm here because my parents dragged me here. I don't, I don't really even know what I believe. This is something to consider. This is gonna be something that you're gonna be like, okay, what does this mean for me? And it's this. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Think about that. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be whose? Theirs. Those who are holding on to the things that they, see, they think are most important, things that they're holding on that everybody says, hey, this, this is so valuable, you better not lose this or you better not part with this. Anything that we put in higher esteem than God is an idol. I don't care whether it's a possession or an attitude or a thought or an action. Whatever you put as more important than God is an idol. And when we hold on to worthless idols, things that aren't going to bring you life, things that are limited, things that are going to disappoint you, things that are going to hurt you, when we hold on to those things, we forfeit Grace that could be ours. Imagine this. Somebody hanging on to a rope over a gorge. It's a thousand feet down and they're holding on. They can't hold on forever and they know that, but they're holding on, they're dangling there. 
a helicopter comes and a guy leans out and says, take my hand. I can pull you to safety. And that person's holding on. And in classic movie fashion, the rope begins to break. <laughs> and they drop a little lower. And the person in the helicopter is saying, take my hand. Safety is right here. Life is right here. And in classic movie fashion, <laughs> you say, no, I can't let go. And you start screaming at the TV at that point, you're going to die. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. There's going to come a point where they have to decide either I am going to trust and I'm going to release and grab on to the one who is promising me life or I'm just going to hang on to this and I guess hope for the best. Those who cling to worthless idols I don't know what your idol is. I don't know what you cling to as so valuable that even if God is saying, give this up, change this, resist this, that you're going, I'm, I'm gonna hold on. I think this is better. This is more satisfying right now in the moment. This is more fun. I don't want to have to say no. When we cling to worthless idols, we're forfeiting grace that could be ours. God is going, I have forgiveness for you. I have restoration for you. I have redemption for you. I have love for you. I have hope for you. I have joy for you. I have peace for you. And so often we're sitting there hanging on to a broken rope going, we are forfeiting. You guys, it's there. The grace of God, the hope, the love, the joy, the peace, the forgiveness of God is right there. And he's going, choose life. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. If you've played sports, there's nothing worse than a forfeit. Ugh. Man, I'd rather get my butt kicked in an uneven, unfair game, then forfeit. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. When Jonah realizes this is what he's been doing, when he has been allowed, that he has been allowing his hatred of the Ninevites, his bitterness toward them and the idea that God would show mercy to them and ugh, it made him sick to his stomach. He would actually be willing to run from God's will. When he realized that he was forfeiting the grace that God had for him, that God was offering to him. In the next verses, he begins to praise. With shouts of grateful praise, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord commanded the fish. <laughs> so now, I love that God is just in charge of everything. God commands the fish. All right, drop him. And thankfully he came out the front end. <laughs> you never thought about that? It's like this could have gone way worse for Jonah. <laughs> the whale comes near shore. The fish comes near shore and pukes Jonah out. Notice what Jonah needed to go through before God released him from his difficult situation. God's grace can take different forms. Sometimes we are saved from difficulty and, and we're it's like, oh man, something could really bad could have happened and I, I received grace. I'm so, I'm so thankful for that. I received mercy. Sometimes God goes, you know what? This is so much more important than your discomfort. This is so much more important than how you feel right now. I'm going to let you suffer. And we hate that. We don't like, God, that's not nice. 
And God is going, you guys, I am so much more concerned with where your heart is at than whether you think I'm nice. And there are times he'll let us sit in it. And we just like, oh, how much longer? And it wasn't until Jonah came to a place of going, God, I recognize who you are and what you've called me to. I recognize I'm, I'm broken. And I will recommit to what you've called me to. I'll do what you've called me to do. And at that point, God releases him. So as we go today, I want you to think about a few things for your own life. And we're all, we're all at a different place. I don't know which one of these is going to be like your number one, like, whoa, that's, that's me, or this is, my, this is my thing. How are you forfeiting grace that could be yours? What are you holding on to that God's saying, let go, grab me, and you're going to receive life? Is it your reputation? Is it your boyfriend or girlfriend? Is it a, an activity? Is it a, an addiction? What is it that you're holding on to and going, this is good for now, I think, I'm just going to hope for the best, and you're holding on to it and you're forfeiting the grace and the life that God has for you. You are unwilling to trust that who God says he is, he actually is, and that what God says he'll do, he'll actually do. What are you holding on to that is causing you to forfeit the grace, the hope, the joy, the love, the peace, the forgiveness that God has for you? And are you willing, if you are finding yourself in a place of going, man, I'm holding on to this rope, but I know it's breaking and life is falling apart and things aren't good. Are you willing to turn from your will, your plan for life, and turn to him in obedience? Go, you know what? I'm going to go where you lead me. And these things have to go hand in hand because it's so easy for us to come to youth group, nod our heads, walk out the door and be like, okay, back to life. Back to my routine, back to my habits, back to the way I treat people, back to the way I gossip, back to the way I offend people, back to the way, whatever it may be. And we find ourselves just holding on to worthless idols. And we're forfeiting the grace that God has for you. And then we blame God. Why are you letting this? Why do I have to? God has it for each of us, but will we take it? Lord, my heart is so convicted in this. Every time I read this verse or hear this verse, I just, I'm reminded, God, of the ways that I, I try and be so in control. I hold on so tight because it feels secure in the moment or it's part of my plan. And God, I confess in front of all here, God, I confess that I cling to worthless idols. But God, I don't want to forfeit the grace you have for me. I don't want to just do things under my own power. So I pray that you would remind me of your presence, that you, your Holy Spirit would work in me. God, that I would be willing to release, to grab onto you and trust that you are who you promised to be. And Lord, I lift up every soul in this room those that are crying out for you, those who have stopped crying out for you, those don't, who, who don't know what they're crying out for. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them and, and God, that you would stir up their heart the way you stirred up Jonah. That there would be that conviction in our heart, but that it would lead us to love and it would lead us to you. God, show us what it is that you have for us and mold our hearts the way that you molded Jonah's to be willing to step out in obedience to that. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a quick follow-up to this. One of the things that can often be, make this really tough is um, we try and do it alone. So if you're here today and you're like, I know what my idol is. I know the thing that God's calling me to, or I know the thing that I'm supposed to give up. Tell somebody about it. Because once you tell somebody and you say, hey, will you ask me about this next week? Well, now there's accountability. 
And now you're faced with the option of like, okay, well, I can either directly lie straight to somebody's face <laughs> next week when they ask me, or I can do something about this and I can take some action and, and I can do some, do some things. So if this is something serious for you, then uh, tell somebody about it and let them know that it's something God has put on your heart and something that you're needing to do. And let's, let's watch him work. Let's see what he does. Cool? Love you guys.